Okay. We're in uh, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Uh, the outline for the sermon is on your app too. That's on there. Uh, that app is awesome. Recently, uh, Crystal was going through Facebook and she found a, uh, some clips of really, really bad answers uh, on Family Feud. And she shared some of them with me. It was, it was hilarious. So, um, Steve Harvey, the host, he asked this one guy, uh, the question was, uh, finish this phrase, a pie in the blank. Of course, you had to guess one of the most common answers to it that would be on the board. So, a pie in the blank. And what would you think? A pie in the face? Uh, maybe a pie in the oven? Something like that? So he asked that question, the guy hit his buzzer, and Steve Harvey and Peter said, a pie in the, and the guy said, horse. <laughs> horse. That's what you think of when you think of a pie in the, <laughs> I mean, even on the spot, you've got to come up with something better than that. A pie in the house, or a horse. So um, Steve Harvey was doubled over with laughter, I mean, that, that doesn't even make any sense. Wrong answer. Of course, it wasn't on the board. Um, and then another question was, what would be an inappropriate suit to wear to work? What would be an inappropriate suit to wear to work? Birthday. Yeah, well, there you go. That would be one. That would probably be on the board. That, that would be something that you would answer, you know, or some outlandish, crazy outfit. Well, he kind of hit the buzzer and he goes, chicken soup. <laughs> Obviously, the guy thought he said soup. You're wearing a suit, and of course Steve Harvey said suit. Oh, okay. Well, then the answer is different there. So what? Well, you wouldn't you wouldn't wear chicken suit to work. I mean, I guess you would. Wrong answer. Well, here in Romans chapter ten, Paul is dealing with a very bad wrong answer that the Jews are giving to the question: How does one have a righteous standing before God? The question is. How do you have a right standing for God? And many of the Jews in Paul's day did not have the right answer to this. It begins here at the end of chapter 9, and then we read here in verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? That is, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They missed out on righteousness by faith. Instead, they pursued it as by works. And it wasn't just faith in general, it was faith in someone. This is where they had the wrong answer. Verse 33, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This is, of course, Jesus Christ. And so they stumbled over the gospel, over the person of Jesus Christ. They didn't have faith in Christ. Chapter 10, verse 2. Paul says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. When it comes to the question of how do I have a right standing before God and in God's eyes be right with Him, many of the Jews of Paul's day had the answer, chicken soup, horse. It wasn't the right answer. It wasn't even close. The answer is faith. And so Paul is going to talk about the right answer in this passage. It is righteousness based on faith. Beginning here in verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith. That is the right answer. And Paul calls this here in verse 9. He says at the end, he says, That is the word of faith that we proclaim. The word of faith. The word here means message. It means you proclaim a message here. So Paul says we proclaim this message, this gospel of faith. That is faith in context here in Jesus Christ. So the gospel, he says, is about righteousness based on faith. And so that's the title of our message here this morning. The message of righteousness based on faith. 
So uh, when we say righteousness here, we have to make sure we understand what we're talking about here. We're talking about what Paul had, the same word that Paul's been using to be declared righteous before God. That is, we are not practically righteous. We still sin and fall short of the glory of God. But even though we sin, God now says that we are righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. He declares it to be so. And so our, uh, our message here, when Paul talks about the message of righteousness based on faith. So we have to uh, say that the gospel is something that should include righteousness based on faith. This is what separates Protestants from Catholics. It's not just a distinction, but it goes to the very heart of the gospel here that Paul's talking about. Catholics do not agree that you are justified or declared righteous based on faith alone. They don't believe that. And yet, if you know Catholic doctrine, they call themselves, the church, is the fullness of the gospel. Lately, Catholics have recognized that people outside the Catholic church can have ecclesial bodies and can have bits and pieces of the gospel. But the fullness of the gospel is the Catholic church. What's one of the great ironies of history? That the very tradition that says they're the fullness of the gospel denies one of the core uh, concepts of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is righteousness based on faith. So there's the Catholics. And I know everyone's in the spirit of unity and community, but we have to unite around the truth. And this is the core truth of the gospel. But are we practical Catholics in this, in this area? We have to make sure that the gospel that we proclaim is the gospel of righteousness by faith. Look what Paul says here in verse 9. He says, this is the word of faith that we proclaim. Paul is in an evangelistic mode here, if you will. Paul is talking about righteousness. He's talked about uh, justification. He's talked about it in different ways. But here, in chapters 9 through 11, he's in an evangelistic mode. And Paul says, this is the gospel I proclaim. This is what I tell people about getting saved, in other words. This is the gospel proclaimed. Paul, in chapter 6 and 8, he looked at the gospel and how it applies to the Christian life. Same gospel. But now he's talking about the gospel that is proclaimed among the unevangelized. And so we have to make sure that the gospel we proclaim is the gospel of righteousness based on faith. Sometimes they ask people, you know, they talk about how they had witnessed to someone and shared the gospel with them. And I asked them, well, what did you tell them? He said, man, I told God changed my life and Jesus Christ just came in and, and just renewed my life and given me hope and meaning. I said, that's awesome, man. Well, what else did you tell them? Well, I told them Jesus is awesome. I said, that's right, man. Jesus is awesome. What else did you tell them? Paul says here that we got to tell people when we give them the gospel that righteousness is based on faith. That is a paradigm shift for most everybody in the world. That you have faith in Christ and that is a righteous standing before God. So we need to make sure we're not practical Catholics in our evangelism. That we get the word out. It's so important. That's why he says in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, the same word, the same gospel, the same proclamation of faith in Christ. How are people going to be saved? They're going to be saved from hearing the gospel. Paul in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2 says, How did you receive the Spirit? By the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? In other words, Paul says, Did you hear the gospel? Did you respond in faith and receive the Spirit? How did you get saved? How did you get this indwelling of the Spirit of God, which is the down payment? for uh, eternal life. Paul says you got it through faith because you heard the gospel. People get saved because they hear the gospel. So we got to tell them the gospel. And Paul says you need to tell them this righteousness is based on faith. So as Paul develops this idea of righteousness based on faith, this message, uh, he says uh, three things about it here. In verses 6 through 8, we have the revelation of the righteousness by faith. The revelation of this message. And all of this is on your outline here. Uh, and then in verses uh, 9 and 10, we have the requirements of righteousness based on faith. In other words, Paul is going to talk a little bit about what is really required. What, um, how do we define this righteousness based on faith? And then finally, in the rest of the from verses, um, verses 11 through 13, we have the recipients of righteousness based on faith. So you got the revelation, the requirements, and then the recipients of righteousness based on faith.
As we look here, let's read what Paul says here about this first part. Verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So Paul is quoting here what we had read in the Old Testament passage about Moses addressing Israel. And he said, you can't say that you don't know God's will and way of salvation. You don't have to go to the heights of heaven or down to the, the depths of the sea here. Uh, the word is near you. You've been given God's, God's message. And so Paul parallels that with the gospel of Jesus Christ today. He says, you don't need to go down into the grave where Jesus was, like Jesus left that truth down there. You don't have to go to the heights of heaven to be with Jesus. He didn't go up there with it. No, he left it here on earth. Historically speaking, the gospel has been revealed. The gospel of righteousness based on faith. And so what Paul says here is near you. You don't need to do a truth quest. You don't need to search for it. God's given it to us. Of course, that's historical. Of course, it's been, as Paul is saying it here, he's talking about the gospel given to Israel and to the Gentiles as well. He's saying they've been given the gospel. But then he goes on in the rest of the chapter and he says, verse 14, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? In other words, Paul recognizes historically righteousness based on faith has come. And yet, you and I have the job of continuing to carry out this. Paul says that the gospel is near, that is, it is accessible. It is also understandable. He says, it is in your mouth. In other words, you can say it. It is something that can be articulated. It is not some kind of mysterious uh, incantation. It is not some kind of, like you would have in the ancient Near East, some kind of mysterious uh, teaching that can't even be verbalized sometimes. Paul says the gospel of Jesus Christ, this righteousness based on faith, is something that we can understand. We can understand it, and we have access to it. And yet you and I must share it with the world. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So it's accessible, and it's also intelligible. We can understand it. That's the revelation of righteousness based on faith. It has been brought near through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verses 9 and 10 talk about the requirements of righteousness based on faith. He says, because, that is, the word is near you, here, here's the reason why. And in so doing, not only does Paul give the reasons why, he also gives a definition of what he means by righteousness based on faith. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So when you think about what Paul's saying here, that can be very confusing. I mean, he says here, he says, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. But then you've got to believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. So you don't need to confess that God raised Him from the dead. And, and you don't really have to believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Is there an order here that you have to do? Because He's just saying all you've got to do is confess Jesus is Lord. You don't have to confess what He did on the cross or His resurrection. And then in verse 10 he says, well, you're justified through your heart, you're believing, but then you're saved through what you confess. So is he compartmentalizing things here? Is he prioritizing one thing over the other? And he doesn't even say anything about the death of Christ that paid for our sin. He just says he was dead. What is going on here? If you really try to think about what he's saying here, it can be really confusing if you think about it. So what we have to realize here. In both of these verses, Paul uses mouth and uses heart twice, right? He uses mouth and heart in verse 9 and mouth and heart in verse 10. Well, that started at the end of chapter eight, uh, verse 8. 
when he had said here, quoting from Deuteronomy 30, the word is near you, it's in your mouth and in your heart. And Paul continues that phrase 9 through 10 to talk about righteousness based on faith. In other words, it's just a rhetorical feature. Paul is using it rhetorically. He's not giving a lot of meaning to it. He's continuing that thing in order to expound what he means by righteousness based on faith. So we really don't want to place a lot of emphasis on that. It's though you need to confess one thing and believe another. Or that one thing is more important than the other. Or that, or that there's a sequence here. There's, there's none of that going on. Paul is using mouth and heart, continuing his quotation from Deuteronomy 30 in a way that just structures what he's saying here about the gospel of righteousness based on faith. So the emphasis here for us, though, what we really get out of this is two things. Righteousness based on faith requires two things. The right kind of faith and the right Jesus. Okay? So, so here's what he says here about faith. He says, faith, he said, you, you confess that Jesus is Lord. That is faith expressed. But you believe it in your heart, too. So it's, it's something that goes down to the center of who you are. The word for heart here means the center of who you are. Where you think, where you feel, where you make decisions, where, where your will is at. And Paul says, this belief in Christ goes all the way down to the heart of who we are. But it is something that is expressed in confession. You remember in chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says, his apostleship is to call all the people to the obedience of faith. That is, faith which produces obedience. For Paul in the New Testament, faith is something that produces obedience in the life of a believer. And so the right kind of faith here that Paul is talking about is a kind of faith that expresses itself in obedience and something goes out to the heart of who we are. So that's a real faith, a genuine faith, not simply a mental assent to the things that Paul says here, but it goes down to the heart of who we are. Secondly here, he talks about who Jesus is. This is the thing. You've got to have a right faith, but you've got to have a right Jesus. He said, well, what are you talking about a right Jesus? There's all kinds of Jesus Jesuses today. There's the Jesus of liberalism, where he's just a good example. We should follow because he was a very loving man, and he gave his life. We should be self-sacrificial like that. There's the cosmic Christ of New Age, where there's a cosmic presence of Christ throughout the universe, and what we try to do is harness that cosmic Christ within us to do what we need to do. There's the Christ of... Um, health and wealth prosperity teaching where Jesus takes your five dollars and he gives you back a hundred you know uh, you give him a hundred dollars and he gets rid of your cancer I call this the puppet Jesus where he's like a marionette and people just do what they need to, to do to get him to serve themselves there's all kinds of ideas about who Jesus is but here's what Paul says about Jesus he says he's the resurrected Lord that's who he is he was resurrected from the dead. He was physically dead and God raised him from the dead. And now he is Lord. That is part of the apostolic preaching of the book of Acts. You crucified him, Peter said, but God raised him up and has exalted him as Lord. That's, that's the gospel. And so for the New Testament writers, when they invited people to have faith in Jesus, it was a decision to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ because he was the resurrected Lord. But Paul even speaks more about Jesus than that. If you look at verse 13 for, for a minute. Paul here quotes Joel 2.32. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In context here, Paul is talking about Lord to refer to Jesus, the resurrected Lord. In Joel 2.32, the word for Lord there, the Hebrew word, is Yahweh, the true God. Paul applies the word for Yahweh, Lord here, to Jesus. Because he believes that Jesus is God. Right? The New Testament writers had no problem with taking these, these passages and talk about Yahweh and applying them to Jesus Christ. Because they believed he was God. So, the Jesus of righteousness based on faith is a Jesus who is God incarnate, the resurrected Lord. That's 
That's the right Jesus. So that's the requirements. Right faith and the right Jesus. Lastly here in verses 11 through 13, we have the recipient. Who gives his righteousness based on faith? Well, here's what he says. Verse 12. Uh, verse 11 rather. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. That is the shame of rejection. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what Paul says here is, Jew and Greek, both of them receive God's riches. And this is part of Paul's wealth language that he has in his letters. The wealth and riches of God in Christ Jesus. The wealth and blessings of salvation. And so Paul says, who gets this? Jews and Greeks? So, so God is someone who is impartial and generous with his righteousness based on faith. Paul talks about people who call on the name of the Lord. And uh, sometimes people look at this and say this is a basis for asking people to pray to receive Christ. But in the Old Testament, calling on the Lord was just a part of worship of believers. Uh, it, was, it was a description of, of people who followed the true God. So it was a statement of worship, a statement of allegiance, not so much a statement of how you get saved. And we see this a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, and I'll read that for you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what Paul does here, he says, the believers at Corinth are people who call on the name of the Lord. They're sanctified. They're saints. And so what he's doing is describing Christians. So Paul isn't talking about how people get saved calling on the name of the Lord. He's saying, who are these people who call on the name of the Lord? Who are these believers? It is whomever God decides to bestow His riches upon. God is generous and impartial with His righteousness based on faith. In other words, God saves all kinds of people. That's what it means. You know that God's saving people and wants to save people that don't look like you and don't look like me. They don't talk like us. They don't act like us. But God wants to save them because God is impartial and He's generous with this righteousness based on faith. This is the crowd that we read about in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7 chapter 9 says this, After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from among every nation, and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Every nation, every tribe, all these peoples and all these languages. See, God is generous. He is impartial with righteousness based on faith. This gospel that he holds out to the world. Practically here, what we learn about the gospel. Well, here's what we learn about sharing the gospel. First of all, uh, it, it's near, but we got we got to share it. We got to share the gospel. Secondly, we got to make sure we have the right Jesus in preaching the gospel, and we got to tell people about righteousness based on faith. This is the gospel proclaimed. This was Paul's evangelistic strategy. This is how he preached the gospel. And this is how you and I need to preach the gospel. All the things we tell them are great, but we've got to tell them that righteousness is based on faith. And finally, we need to understand that God wants to save all kinds of people. So that means God calls us to all kinds of people. And that's what we're doing. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. We praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful gospel, this righteousness based on faith, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that that would uh, be on our lips as we share the word of Christ with our co-workers, our neighbors, uh, those at the volleyball court, those in our family, that we would get the gospel right when we share it. And then as we share it, Lord, 
We would do it indiscriminately because we know you are impartial and generous with this wonderful gospel that you've given us. So Lord, I thank you for all the work that you're doing through our missional communities, our Great Commission groups. And uh, I pray, God, you'll continue to use us to reach people for your glory. I, I thank you, Lord, for a church that is really concerned about living and sharing, spreading this good news of Jesus Christ throughout our city, Lord. And we pray for our city, Lord. They don't know you. So many people uh, are without you, Lord. And they're going to hell. And they don't, uh, they don't have purpose in life. And uh, they're lost. And Lord, I know there's so many of them, Lord, uh, you're going to lead us to. And I just pray, Father, that we'll be faithful to carry the true gospel to them. And uh, you'll give us wisdom and boldness to carry out the gospel in a way that pleases you, Lord. I pray and I lift up our city. I lift up all the people here, Lord. And pray that you'll use our church among other churches to uh, glorify your name and extend your lordship throughout this city that people will look to Charlotte, North Carolina and say, there is a city in which Jesus Christ is exalted and glorified, Lord. And we'll be known uh, for that, Lord. So I pray you'll help us in that endeavor, Lord. I know it's on your heart more than it is ours. Uh, I pray that we would just be gospel people, Lord. And um, I pray your blessings on us here as we continue in worship. Um, we ask for your hand of blessing and strength at this time. In the name of Christ Jesus, our resurrected Lord, the great God and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.